Virus worsens dramatically in Michigan, and Metro Detroit becomes one of the nation's virus centers and hospitals near the breaking point. And the nation is in the middle of a massive experiment on working from home. How does it, well, work? Today is Sunday, March 29th, 2020, and this is Flashpoint. All right, welcome to Flashpoint. We're going to get right to it this morning on the coronavirus crisis. Yesterday, we saw the biggest single day jump in cases yet in Michigan, and we're getting close now to 5,000 cases in our state. A really strong barometer of where we are, the announcement that the auto show planned for June has been canceled, not because of worries over the event itself yet, but because TCF Center is being converted into a field hospital to handle the expected volume of patients. I want to start this morning with the latest from Governor Whitmer, who's going to be appearing on Meet the Press right after Flashpoint. Here's what she had to say a few moments ago. Our numbers are climbing exponentially. We knew it was a matter of time, not if COVID-19 would come to Michigan. We took aggressive measures. We've been on the front end of aggressive measures that states have been taking, but we see this astronomical rise. We've got hospitals that are already at capacity. We're running out of PPE as well. I'm grateful we got a shipment from FEMA yesterday for 112,095 masks, but um, you know, we're going to be in dire straits again in a matter of days, and so we are keeping up the pressure and working 24-7 at the state level and grateful that there are people who are doing that at the federal level as well. But this is um, not something that we should be fighting each other on. It should be everyone fighting COVID-19, right. everyone versus COVID-19. More of that interview coming up here on Meet the Press. Now let's turn back to the hospital situation, which she mentioned. Very happy to have with us this morning Bob Riney, the chief operating officer of Henry Ford Health System. Uh, Bob, I, I, I know uh, I've known you for a long time. Uh, you have, I, I have to imagine, never seen anything, anything at all like this. Uh, good morning, Devin, and you're absolutely right. I've been in healthcare um, now 40 years, and we've been through a lot of challenges, but nothing that has the complexity that this COVID-19 crisis has brought to us. Yeah, uh, to give give us an update here on where we are at capacity across the Henry Ford system, which of course is one of several in our area. Most of our Henry Ford hospitals reached capacity yesterday. Um, and uh, we are working hard with our colleague health systems, both in Southeast Michigan and outside of uh, Southeast Michigan to make sure that we can take care of all of these patients. But uh, the volume surge that we've experienced in the last uh, three nights and that we anticipate will trend uh, at least for the next week is something that is uh, just relying on us using every ingenuity we can to make sure that we are treating all our patients in a safe and quality manner. I, I know right now a lot of this is conjecture at this point, and it's not uh, safe even to try to make projections, but you mentioned at least the next week. Do you have a sense of where we might be on the curve? We believe that we have not hit the peak yet, but the peak is near. Um, and then how fast we can start descending off that peak is really something that's still the subject of a lot of predictive analysis, um, but uh, we're nowhere near out of this crisis. Yeah. By any well, the, this news of trying of turning TCF into a field hospital, basically, we've talked about a number of other facilities, two dorms at Wayne State, the Pistons practice facility. But Bob, it's one thing to find space to put people; it's another to find. Uh, the manpower to handle it and uh, all of the systems, the logistical systems that need to go into place. How ready are we for that part of moving beyond our hospitals? I think that's our biggest challenge, Devin. Um, as you uh, articulated, these patients are very complex and they're very sick and they require not only incredible clinical talent, but the equipment to support those clinical teams. and. Um, most of our hospitals could squeeze out more physical capacity to accommodate additional patients, but we don't have the human talent capacity. Our teams are just working at such a stretched pace. And so we're all working right now to see whether we can tap into healthcare workers from other states that aren't experiencing this kind of surge. I saw that Delta announced today that they would fly healthcare workers to Michigan for free. Yeah. Um, if they are coming in, we're looking at how we can tap into every resource. We're moving our um, clinical staff that have been working in um, non-hospital settings into support our hospital care. Uh, but keep in mind, that's not a one for one because many of them haven't worked in an inpatient setting for a while so they can support 
our core team, but they can't replace those incredibly talented nurses and physicians that are there on the front line every day. Have we got a, even a handle yet on what that need, that manpower need is going to be yet, or is that changing day by day? It's changing day by day, but if you look at the capacity in most of the hospitals in Southeast Michigan now, and the ability to stretch that capacity, we're talking about a need for hundreds, if not thousands, of additional medical workers. Yeah. Uh, have we been able to get a handle yet, Bob, on why Detroit has become a hot spot? Um, I, I believe the fifth highest number of cases I I in the country at my last check. Have we got a, any sort of thoughts on why that's happened? You know, there's a lot of speculation, and, you know, one of the theories is that we're such an international hub and yep. we had lots of people coming and going before the extent of this virus was really known. Uh, there's another assumption that we're a, a region that has a lot of underlying chronic health conditions, which complicates the ability to uh, recover. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think there's going to be an incredible amount of information that will come from thorough analysis on what formed a hotspot, what didn't form a hotspot, and most importantly, what are the lessons that we've learned so that, you know, God forbid, if we face something like this again, we will be far better prepared. Yeah, well, uh, yes, there was no, the, the, the playbook on this coming out of it is gonna be massive, no doubt. I had wondered if, if it had anything to do with the fact that it got into the police department. Once it got in there, that would seem to be a pretty fair point from which to spread it around. Well, there's certainly truth of the fact that, you know, those that are in, uh, in work or in um, life that have done a lot of socialization in big crowds that may have carried the virus and not known it could have spread that. So first responders are certainly, you know, a concern, um, but there are really a lot of theories and I think we'll learn a lot more down the road. I wanted to talk about your people that are working on the front lines on this. We've all now seen nurses doing sort of first-person testimonials on social media, and some of it is just uh, crushingly sad and uh, what they're trying to deal with. Talk a little bit about what you've seen from your folks. Well, first of all, I, I'm not sure I can uh, talk about our team members without shedding tears because I, I'm just overwhelmed with pride, as is our entire executive team over these heroes that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. And I was actually thinking this morning that hero is just actually too short of a word. Um, we need to find a way that really describes the actions that they're doing. And I think one thing that people forget is while they're heroes, they're human beings and they are dealing with the same life challenges that everyone else is, the same fears and anxieties, the challenges, you know, in their own family lives. And they're having to put that aside and you know, 16 hours a day focus exclusively on taking care of patients. And the other uh, just incredible um, emotional impact that they're dealing with is that these are patients that can't have a loved one by their side. They can't have a family member holding their hand because of the infectious nature of this. So if you can imagine the additional emotional um, work that they are um, taken care of for both the families and the patients. They're just extraordinary people. And when all is said and done, I hope that we find meaningful ways as a community to show them how much we value and appreciate them. Uh, I sure hope so too. And that, that points to the fact that we can, a lot of these folks can't even, uh, families can't have funerals right now in the way that they would like to either. Uh, Bob, I so appreciate the update. I know you're working your tail off. Uh, Bob Riney, the Chief Operating Officer of For Henry Ford Health System. Thanks so much, Bob, and stay safe. Thank you. All right, now back to the auto show announcement. A massive disappointment on so many levels as the city was moving the event to summertime. With me now, Jason Stein, publisher of Automotive News. Uh, Jason, uh, first off, I, I, the loss of this event now, we don't know how long it'll be before we finally get it back, but talk overall about uh, losing this event again. Well, losing the event again is indeed a problem for the auto show because it will be 29 months between the last time that we saw the Detroit Auto Show and the next time, uh, the auto show was already suffering in terms of the media play. Uh, wasn't so much of a consumer problem. You know, they were still drawing 750,000 people yeah. uh, every January to see cars. Uh, then what is it? <laughs> I don't even want to think about what this means uh, for all of the hotel and restaurants, uh, that situation which have been doing without this and just went through a very uh, dry winter without it being there in January and now that it's not even on the calendar. What does it mean for the industry to not be focusing at least once a year on the, the Motor City? 
I think that the industry is trans is going through a transformation anyway. You've already seen uh, the Frankfurt Auto Show last year was uh, suffering in, in terms of its uh, media attention, uh, the number of launches. Uh, the industry is trying to find its footing when it's when it really comes to auto shows because automakers are really finding their own way to do things. Yeah. Uh, whether it's it's uh, gathering uh, dealers in their own spaces or launching on their own terms, launching virtually. Auto shows are in a tough place in general, and this doesn't help to now go almost, uh, you know, 30, 30 months without having this uh, Detroit show. Yeah, that's tough. Uh, let's talk about the industry in general. Nobody is going out right now and kicking tires and buying cars. Uh, workers are staying at home. Uh, Ford is talking, I think, optimistically about trying to start the plants back up again in April. But give me your thumbnail on where you think we are. I don't I don't know. It, some people have described this as being in a fog. You know, you, you can't see what's coming at you. You can't see where you're going. You can't see anything around you. And for automakers, dealers, suppliers, uh, they're all in a fog. They can't predict when when they can come out of this. And indeed, nobody is going into showrooms and dealers are losing money at a rapid clip. We know stores are closing. Uh, talked to one guy last week who was losing one hundred thousand dollars a day Oof. as a uh, car dealer. I mean, you've got Obviously, some folks who, if they're over leveraged, uh, they're they're just going to have a cash flow problem. But suppliers also are are getting a bit of a pickup in the in uh, Asia Pacific. But for the most part, in North America, there is no pathway here to figure out when this is going to clear up. Yeah, and this uh, we obviously we've, we're watching this footing where they're trying to get the automakers to work on making ventilators. But this is a very strange um, division that is broken out between the White House and General Motors and Mary Barra. Can you kind of uh, take me through where we are on this? It's very strange. Well, GM was already uh, already had a plan to make ventilators. Uh, they were already uh, well underway. Wh how and why this fight erupted, I have no idea. Uh, this war of words for a couple of folks who had really kind of come to a better place. I mean, Mary Barra and Donald Trump. Um, but I think GM was really caught in a bureaucratic trap, um, and, um, and and ultimately. Uh, also got caught in a different kind of trap, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, in fact, and we, we, when we watched Ford being described, their behavior the other day was described at the White House as patriotic, and that that wasn't what we were seeing from General Motors. This is a, a really a weird thing. Um, what do you suppose is the long-term outlook then uh, for just trying to get back to, and I know it, we're in a fog, <laughs> but, but where does this leave an industry after they've already had a bailout, of course, that was very controversial? Now we've got some stimulus money going into the economy. Economy. Uh, where does that leave the auto industry right now among so many fighting for survival? Well, the auto industry is okay right now in certain pockets because it's well capitalized. Different than 08 and 09 where there was a real cash problem for now. Yeah. So given the fact that, that there's strong cash on the, on the balance sheet, you, you see that Ford and GM have drawn on some loans now, lines of credit. Um, for now, Devin, I would say that the industry is okay, but we've got to come out of this fog in a hurry. Let's hope so. We'll just keep driving straight ahead and hope there's a clearing. Jason, thank you so much for uh, taking us through a number of these issues and stay safe. Thanks, Devin. You bet. Same to you. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, the impact of working at home, which so many are doing. This is Flashpoint on Local 4. Believe. Doesn't that word open up a world of infinite possibilities? In these current tough times, we're all affected in some way or another since we are all connected to the automotive industry. However, we have to believe in each other. Tom Moser Ford is all about giving back to our community. It's an honor to support schools and communities surrounding our dealership. We do all of this because I believe. I believe in helping our community and I believe in the Ford team. We are the heart of the automotive industry. It all started right here, and I encourage you to keep believing. I believe in Ford. I believe in my employees. I believe in our customers. I believe in America. Let's all help each other and... Buy local, buy American, buy Ford, and buy from Tom Holzer Ford. Thank you, and never stop believing. Sincerely, Connie Holzer. Did you purchase your home in 2017 or 2018? If so, rates are at their lowest levels in years and you can take advantage by refinancing today. 
your home appreciation coupled with lower mortgage interest rates make today a great time to call. A free five-minute mortgage review could get you on the path to big savings. Call 248-308-5000 or you can chat with us online at davidhallmortgage.com. Lower payments, better options, more personal attention. I think about my parents, grandparents, and friends. I'm thinking about student loans. Or even this little guy. I miss hanging out with my friends. As you can see from this little face, nobody's happy about it. I'm thinking about a lot of things. I'm slowing the spread by staying at home. I'm staying home. And I am staying inside. I'm staying home to slow the spread. with the medical and social challenges just now, we have quite an experiment underway on working from home. Yes, people have worked from home for a long time, but this is something quite different. And I heard a recent conversation about that on the Freakonomics podcast, which I highly recommend, by the way, with economist Nicholas Bloom, who's a professor at Stanford University, and he's so kind to join us today to talk more about it. Professor Bloom, uh, really good to have you with me. I, you've studied this phenomenon before of the impacts of, of working at home. This is different. But in short, generally, what have you learned about people working at home and the phenomenon, the impact it has on the workplace and output? Well, I, did, I ran a massive experiment back in 2013 on working from home in China. We ran a big scientific experiment. We basically randomized volunteers who work from home for nine months or not. And we found people working from home back then were 13% more productive. We, which is a huge increase yeah. and their quit rates hard. So in that experiment, which people work from home four days a week and they're answering telephone calls, working from home was uh, fantastically productive and it was hugely positive. It was interesting though, um, before we get to the differences that we might see now, uh, you also found though that by the time the experiment was done, people were largely ready to go back to the workplace. Yes, I mean, it wasn't entirely positive. And I, I'm actually very negative on the current situation. But back in the Chinese experience, we found that at the end of the nine months, half of the employees, all of whom had volunteered at the beginning, so, wanted to come back to work. And they basically <laughs> told us they were lonely, they felt isolated. You know, bear in mind, these were people whose average commute time is 40 minutes each way a day. So they were really voting with their feet to spend over an hour a day traveling to work and back simply to be around their colleagues. And isolation is exactly what the point is of what we're doing right now. The other thing is that uh, I'm going to assume that in the, your earlier studies, people didn't have the distractions that they had. I mean, right now, uh, people who are working from home also have their children with them at home and their spouses uh, and, and maybe other family members. So this is a little bit different, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Working, I, you know, I have to say, I'm I'm very uh, unhappy with the working from home situation. I don't think it's helping. I mean, clearly we have to do it for medical reasons, but there's a number of huge challenges. One, you know, you have your kids running around. My four-year-old repeatedly runs into the door, you know, shout, doo-doo, jumps on my bed and runs out. You know, it's not helping my work. Uh, two, when we did it, people expected to have their own rooms. Uh, to work in. I mean, I don't know if you can see, but this is, you know, this is my bedroom right here. Yeah. Uh, not an ideal working from home situation. That door behind me actually needs to do a bathroom. It's hardly, you know, what I would say is conductive to productivity. Um, third factor is, you know, these are people who are only working for, in our experiment, they're working from home four days a week. That fifth day a week's critical for coming in, meeting your colleagues, thinking of new ideas, getting motivated. If you're at home, Five days a week, you feel very isolated and it's really hard to keep going. So maybe it's okay for a week or two, but you know, give it one or two months, this is going to be problematic. Yeah. And then finally, these are all people who volunteered. So right now, nobody's volunteered. We've all been thrown home. You know? right. It's like uh, you know, being thrown out of the plane after 10 minutes of a skydiving lesson. It's, for many of us, it just simply doesn't work. Maybe you know, if you're a dentist, say you've got to meet your customers, or you know, if, if you're in face-to-face -face jobs or you're managing a team. So 
much as for a few people in a few situations this is great for the entire country, I think it's going to be an economic disaster. Well, there's something encouraging as we've worried about the breakdown of personal face-to-face -face communication over these, especially over the last decade. I guess it's a little encouraging to know that people are still longing for it and need it. But we also have a big uh, experiment going on here with education. And as a professor, uh, I'm curious as to what you think uh, this is going to do, not just uh, at, at the higher education level, which you've had some experience with. We've had courses online for some time, but with elementary and uh, secondary education going to uh, people trying to teach their kids at home. Yeah, I mean, I think for education, it's funny, I have four kids raising an age from four to 16, and my older two in high school, it's actually worked really well. I have to say the one glitch of that is the sense of, you know, I live in a nice area and I have, you know, they have a laptop and broadband, but that's, you know, that's gonna really push to make sure there's not big inequality that the whole of the country gets the same, you know, service. The problem I think is for elementary schools and kindergarten, I mean, you just can't do that from home. So yeah. <laughs> they are kicking around. For college students, Stanford is entirely running uh, at home teaching, both the rest, ending up this quarter and next quarter. It works pretty well. I would not say it's perfect. Um, the thing I really miss is, you know, the uh, class interactions and teaching. You can yeah. kind of, one-on-one -on -one meetings is fine because you can do this by Zoom and you have question and answers. It's the big classes of kind of 50, 60 people. It's very hard to do over Zoom. Yeah, I don't think most teachers get into education because they want to just type out lesson plans into a computer. <laughs> um, uh, lastly, I wanted to make sure that uh, since I've got an economist with me to, this morning uh, to talk a little bit about uh, your thoughts, I, I, I really bristle at calling uh, what Congress, pa I hate calling it a stimulus plan. That sounds like it's much more concerned with the economy than it is with people's lives. For I, I think a lot of people would see this as a survival plan, and I think a, a, a number of people are wondering if $1,200 does much towards survival for people who are really hurting? Well, I should point out firstly that it's important to keep the economy going. There's plenty of sure. evidence that when people lose their jobs, their health deteriorates. Death, you know, there's been endless studies over the decades that mortality rates, death rates spike after people lose jobs or their businesses go bankrupt. So as much as we're gonna see, you know, a death rise from COVID-19, I fear we're gonna see a similar rise from the recession. It's not actually obvious which is bigger. So policymakers are correct to try and do something. And, this time around, compared to 2008, 2009, they've been much better. Both the Fed and Congress have had massive stimulus plans. I mean, it's not going to cure everything. It's going to reduce the drop. But, you know, the numbers that are coming out now, they're horrible. I've yeah. just not seen a recession this bad uh, since, you know, obviously in the data going back to the Great Depression. The hope is it will be a short drop and a rapid rebound, which I think is likely. So. 2020, the, you know, the middle of this year is going to be a, just a nightmare economically, but hopefully by the end of the year, we'll see a rapid rebound. We sure hope so. Uh, Professor Nicholas Bloom, joining us from Stanford. I must admit, I'm a little sorry your four-year-old didn't make an appearance <laughs> <laughs> jumping in through the back. But really, really good to talk to you this morning. Thanks so much for the time. Okay, thanks, Ed. You bet. Bye. We'll be back with more. This is Flashpoint on Local 4. Back in just a second. With Michigan weather being so unpredictable, spend tax returns and profit sharing checks where it matters most, your home. Call Ace and Sons today. These are difficult times. The Detroit Wayne Integrated Health Network is here with hundreds of trained clinicians offering face-to-face -face help to you through this crisis. Consider downloading the My Strength app, an interactive support tool offering daily encouragement. My Strength will help you with your mental well being. You are not alone. The Detroit Wayne Integrated Health Network is here to talk, here to help. 800 241 4949. A drunk driver killed my husband. The person turned left right in front of me. It happened in an instant. I was ejected from the car and it landed right on top of me. My whole life changed. I didn't know what to do. Insurance companies count on you not knowing what to do, but I do. I got smart. I got Mike. I got Mike. After an accident, you'll have bills. You'll have medical problems, but you'll also have me, Mike Morse. Call me and let's go for the win. 855-MIKE-WINS. Next New Ellen, Sean Hayes and Chelsea Handler. If I were in art school and got to sculpt a male celebrity, it would be. Well, I mean, not you. Ellen, Monday at 3 on Local 4.
Let's all take a deep breath. Remember that we have made it through tough times in this city before. In every crisis, think about what allowed us to rise above and come out stronger. Our love for this community, working in unity, and taking care of our neighbors. And if this challenging time teaches us anything, it's that we really do need each other. Detroiters are gritty and tough, but know that strength comes from having each other's back. Together, Metro Detroit, we will make it through this crisis too. Finally this morning, we lost two young leaders in Detroit this past week. Graham Davis was the city's communications director. We lost him this week, not to coronavirus, but to cancer. He was just 33 years old and a real believer in Detroit and our thoughts with his wife, Rachel. And coronavirus took the life of Marlo Stoudemire. He was the face and voice of Detroit 67 at the Detroit Historical Society. He was just 43 and had a lot more left to do. Honestly, I'm looking forward to black folks being at the table more in terms of having more equity. You have organizations like Capital Impact Partners and J.P. Morgan Chase investing in trying to bring more black developers to the table so we can be a part of this change and this boom that's happening. Uh, a lot of small businesses getting uh, infusions of cash, um, leadership shifts, right? Use a lot of succession planning, right? People talk about it, but we don't do it really well. And what I'm starting to see is a lot of young black people getting a chance to step up to the table and we have the talent we have that skill set black developers black business owners because I think we need more balance because the face of the narrative has primarily been focused on the Dan Gilberts of the world and whatnot and I mm. think you're starting to see whether it be philanthropy and even some businesses really believe that this is the time for us to start balancing that out a little bit so conversations on equity in 2018 yeah. across the board from boardrooms to how you hire to giving people a chance to get business loans and be a part of this game because because I'm going to be a part of it and we can't wait and it's important. Sure is and was. Uh, we're thinking about his wife Valencia and their two children. One more voice silenced out of more than a hundred lives that have been lost to Michiganders to coronavirus. That's going to do it for us this morning. Thanks so much for being here. Meet the Press coming up next. Again, Governor Whitmer will be a part of uh, Meet the Press this morning. You'll see it next year on Local 4. Have a great week. We'll see you next time on Flashpoint. Stay safe.